So I'm now currently on level four of the shell building. Outside, beautiful rebels are holding the doors. Uh, I'm gonna continue having a mooch around. Um, I don't really want to be doing this. I'm quite nervous taking this action. Um, to basically highlight Shell's aggressive approach to extracting oil in foreign countries. In recent years, there has been an uptick in acts of resistance, such as civil disobedience and direct action in liberal democratic states. Think about environmental protests like Just Stop Oil. Think about the uh, decolonization protests. Think about racial justice protests. Uh, and now anti-war protests, like the ones against the war in Israel and Palestine. This creates a quandary, right? Because there is a general assumption that liberal democratic states, you know, states like Australia, America, Great Britain, Germany, are sufficiently just to command obedience. Is there a place for resistance in liberal democracies? Now, civil disobedience is an interesting form of resistance. It's probably one that we are largely familiar with. But what exactly is civil disobedience? Its classic formulation comes from John Rawls, right? He highlights that it is principled lawbreaking to highlight an injustice and to appeal to the conscience of one's fellow citizens. It is primarily a communicative action. It's a group of citizens saying, this is unacceptable to us. We are breaking the law to show un how unhappy we are. And we hope that this will reach the minds of our fellow citizens. Classic example of this would be the civil rights movement in the United States, uh, where laws were broken to demonstrate unhappiness with the injustice of Jim Crow. Right? And remember, they were breaking the law. The marches that happened in Birmingham, Alabama, were against the law. That's why you see the cops swarming the protesters. Right? But these laws, they were unjust laws. They were trying to get change to happen in America. Now, it's important to note, this was not premised on the rejection of the institutions of the state, but it was looking to improve them. We can draw a really strong line between someone like the early Martin Luther King, and the Black Panthers, for example. One was a reformist, the other one was revolutionary. Militants won't say we can improve the state. They will say, this state is fundamentally unjust. We have to rebuild it from the ground up. The more moderate civil disobedience is about change. It is about working within a system to produce a good outcome. Now, one of the things that people often assert with civil disobedience is that there is an obligation to accept punishment for breaking the law. This principle is often called the fidelity to law principle. And we can see it in the practice of Martin Luther King Jr. If you read the letter from Birmingham jail, he has a very compelling section where he says, I'm in jail as a sign of good faith to other people. I am acting in a way to show that I'm not merely a criminal. I'm not breaking the law for breaking the law's sake. I'm drawing attention to something. And if I have to be sanctioned for that, so be it. I will go to jail because I believe in this cause. I will show you that I am acting honestly. It's compelling, right? Rawls basically says the same thing. He says that we have a duty to obey the law even when we have a duty to break the law. It's a bit paradoxical. We might actually ask whether there is something more than a strategic expedient at times. So I can definitely see the point the king's making, right? This is something that's really quite profound to do, to go to jail for your beliefs, to accept punishment for your beliefs. But is it necessary, right? The question might be like, mm, well, for whom is this a nearly just state? It's easy for Rawls, for example, to write about fidelity of the law, given who he was. His perspective is the perspective of Harvard Yard. He was a very secure, very well off, respected part of the community. The costs that other people might occur by protesting might be unreasonable. Let's say you're a working class person, for example. Can you afford to go to jail? Can you afford a lawyer? If your protest gets you arrested, are you going to have a criminal record for the rest of your life? Whereas if someone like Rawls were to be arrested, he could probably afford a lawyer and cop a plea, or they might just let him go because they don't want the bad press. These are questions that a lot of people who are on the liberal side of thinking about civil resistance don't really understand. Now, when we think about civil resistance from a more radical perspective, we get a different answer to this question. Uh, Candice Delma has given us a really compelling argument about why we need to flip that argument.
flip it around. She says the burden isn't on us to obey the state. The state has to prove to us that it is worth supporting. It can't assume obedience. Now, under these circumstances, fidelity to the law cannot be a duty. We have to come first with resistance. The world or the state has to be able to convince us that it is worth following. Now, think about the case of whistleblowers. For example, Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden. These are people who leaked information breaking the law, and they certainly did not want to get caught doing it. They tried to do it uh, relatively anonymously. They have tried to avoid jail at all costs. Think about um, Assange. He's still trying to avoid jail. Snowden lives in Russia. Manning went to jail for quite some time. Should they go to jail? This is a question that you should ask yourself. I would say no. Should someone accept that they should go to jail if they expose the fact that the American government has been engaged in systemic torture of prisoners of war? This seems to be something that is a bridge too far. But we should think about the context, because I think that makes a big impact. And we shouldn't say fidelity to the law is limited to simply obeying the law. There's a deeper thing underneath there, and that is good faith. Good faith towards our fellow citizens. And this is where we get to see a tension right now in the protests against the war between Israel and Palestine. Right now, we can have a lot of sympathy with mass civilian casualties, and we can think that it's an outrage. So how does fidelity to the law come in? Do we need to obey the police if they come at us with uh, riot gear? Not necessarily, but we might say that we do have a duty of fidelity to our fellow citizens, right? We want to make sure that, say, Jewish citizens aren't feeling like they're being targeted for anti-Semitic abuse. We need to be clear on our messaging. We need to act in a way that is open and honest to our fellow citizens that isn't giving aid and comfort to, say, fascistic or anti-Semitic elements. There are always going to be guardrails to how we exercise our rights. Resisting injustice doesn't give us a free hand to do whatever we want. We are still bound to respect the rights of others, even as we are trying to resist unjust institutions. And that is all I got to say about the right of resistance. Show the Bentham's head one more time.